So welcome to Other Frontiers of State and Federal Advocacy, Litigation, Legislative Advocacy, and Rulemaking, although in our email crosstalk before this event, it came up this, that this panel should have been called um, New Frontiers of, um, of State and Federal Advocacy. Um, I know it's been a long day, and with hope, it's been a worthwhile and inspiring day as well. Today, we spent a lot of time discussing direct services to veterans with less than fully honorable discharges, namely discharge upgrade applications to the, board, uh, to the boards of review, which is some of the boards of review, and character dis of uh, discharge determinations submitted to the Department of Veterans Affairs. When, when planning this discussion, the panel and I had a collective goal of educating you about the universe of advocacy possibilities that exist for veterans with less than fully honorable discharges, past individual discharge upgrade applications, and character of service um, uh, determination applications. Ultimately, we seek to inspire you and to ask you to join this renaissance in discharge upgrade work and in advocacy in general when it comes to veterans with less than fully honorable discharges. Um, I've said this earlier today. To me, the golden age of advocacy for veterans with less than fully honorable discharges was like the late 70s and the early 80s. Um, and this corner is laid fallow for many years afterwards. But now in 2018, we are very fortunate as advocates and Americans to be living in this renaissance I keep on, I keep on talking about. And that renaissance is being fueled by people like yourselves, advocates, law school, uh, law school students, law school professors, volunteer attorneys, and members of our state and federal government. And what all these people have in common is that they have creativity and vision when it comes to what I've what I've said uh, earlier today, what I feel is a national crisis. The lack of advocacy for the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of American veterans who are stigmatized and deprived of benefits um, due to their less than fully honorable discharges, um, many of which were for uh, misdemeanor type offenses or less. And, uh, and many, of, many vets who li live with mental illness, including post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, and, and, uh, and veterans who are also survivors of military sexual trauma. So now, late in the day, we're going to discuss a broad spectrum of, of, uh, of creative and impactful advocacy that not only helps veterans with less than fully honorable discharges, it develops an advocacy and policy toolkit for in those who engage in those efforts. It builds up their, 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 the, the things that they're able to do, even past work on behalf of less than fully, uh, veterans with less than fully honorable discharges. And many of these uh, efforts are exemplary, and it's our hope that in time in Montana and other places, we're going to see these efforts replicated and improved upon, and whether that's litigation or legislative advocacy or federal rulemaking or working with the press or creating innovative volunteer programs for law students or working with state government to assist veterans for negotiating the discharge upgrade pro process. On all of those levels, I, I mean, I think uh, you know, imitation is a, is a form of flattery, but I think uh, improvement is, is an even greater compliment, and uh, because then it comes back, it comes back to uh, people who are engaged in those efforts and spurs them on to even uh, even more uh, uh, visionary efforts. So, with that said, I'd like to introduce the following panelists with abridged bios, with, with the exception of Elena Duterte, who's 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 um, joining us from uh, from Syracuse, New York. Um, Dana Montalto is an attorney and clinical instructor in the Veterans Legal Clinic at the Legal Services Center of Harvard Law School. Um, I think if I say anything more, she's gonna, she might have something to say to me. Um, uh, but <laughs> but Rose, uh, Rose Carmen Goldberg is a supervising staff attorney and former Scadden Fellow at Swords the Plowshares. Um, and uh, Justine uh, Pelham, uh, Justine M. Pelham is a staff attorney at Legal Services of Northern Virginia's Veterans Law Project, where she's establishing a pro bono program to assist veterans in their discharge upgrade applications and VA character of discharge appeals. And that brings us to um, Yolanda Yul uh, Duterte, who is a is a associate teaching professor and the director of the Wall Family Veterans Legal Clinic at Syracuse University College of Law. As director of the clinic, Yolanda supervises in students in the representation of veterans and their families in pursuit of discharge upgrades, VA health care, and VA benefits. She's also a board member of the National Law School Veterans uh, Clinic Consortium and the New York State Discharge Upgrade Advisory Board. And um, uh, Yelena, if you can hear me, I don't want to sell you short on your title, I, basically. And uh, Yelena, uh, as of the end of this school year, will be leading the John Marshall uh, Law School's uh, Veterans Clinic. Uh, Yelena, what's your title uh, going to be? Uh, assistant 
professor and director of the Veterans Legal Support Center and Clinic. And uh, I, I will say that that clinic, the students or the lawyers, sorry, the lawyers and advocates that that um, that clinic produces are a huge part of just the uptick in general knowledge about veterans law and some of uh, and some of the most uh, committed graduates uh, of, of contemporary graduates of law schools when it comes to doing this work out, out in the world. And Yelena is an incredible, not only uh, graduate of the John Marshall Law School, but now uh, I, I'm, I'm sure she's going to be uh, an incredible uh, leader of that clinic uh, as well. So, so uh, with that, we're going to uh, start off with Dana Montalto. So when you're working with veterans who have less than honorable discharges, sometimes there's the problem that you just run into too many problems. There are too many problems to fix all the time. Um, and uh, you just come across barriers and hurdles that they experience. Um, and you can... You only have so many hours in the day, and you have to figure out what to do about them. And so um, I, part of why I was so excited about this particular panel and think it's a great way to end the day is just to think about the, all of the ways that individual advocacy and on behalf of individual veterans can be part of some larger picture. Um, and it can be, there can be really small things you can do to make the lives of a lot of veterans better. So I know Rose mentioned earlier that sometimes when you're reading the VA uh, adjudication manual, you'll find that there's an error in there. And you can actually write them a letter, and they might fix it. And that could have a huge effect that you'll never know. But you're going to run into problems all the time that you think, why, do, why does a service member only get one DD-214 at the very end of multiple enlistments? And then that creates a barrier to them actually getting access to VA. Maybe we should do something about that. You're going to run into things all the time. Why, is, why aren't there video conferences so that people can appear from Montana without having to pay all the way to get down to DC? Um, lots of things to work on. But I will touch on a couple of projects um, that I have had the, the privilege to work with um, in my time, both at the um, Veterans Legal Clinic where I am now, and then also at the Veterans Legal Services Clinic at Yale Law School, where I was before, where uh, I met Rose, where I met Rob. Um, that has been on, on a lot of the forefront of, uh, as Rob says, the renaissance of discharge upgrade advocacy. Um, uh, so one big area is federal litigation. Individual advocacy on behalf of veterans seeking discharge upgrades has led to a lot of what we've been talking about today with the Hagel Memorandum, the Curta Memorandum. They, they sort of flow from um, a couple of class actions that were filed. Um, by the Yale Law School Veterans Legal Services Clinic on behalf of Vietnam veterans who had post-traumatic stress disorder that, because they served during Vietnam, was not diagnosed in service. Um, they had been denied by the boards um, without really any due consideration. Um, and we, I was part of a team that went back and looked at sort of a systematic review of cases where veterans were saying, I had post-traumatic stress disorder related to my combat service. Um, that really explains the misconduct. And those claims were often just being brushed aside, whether because of lack of evidence or just lack of, of favorable legal standards. And so that individual advocacy, when we got to federal court, we thought, well, if we know this is a problem, not just for the, these veterans that we're working with, let's bring it as a class action. Let's fight for other veterans and not just the single veteran. And um, so there were two initial class actions um, on behalf of Jack Shepard and Conley Monk um, that um, in sequence uh, led to the issuance of the Hagel Memorandum, which was the start of this change in the mental health policies and the way that those cases are reviewed by the discharge review, the, the BCMRs and the DRBs. And Following that, there are now actually two, th those cases actually ended up both um, settling, and now we're actually to the stage where there are two cases um, of, that, are, that have been certified as class action. So anyone who is representing a post-9-11 veteran who was a soldier, Marine, or sailor, um, and they have alleged some argument for upgrade based on a, a post-traumatic stress disorder or another mental health condition, you're representing a class member, potentially. 
Um, and so it's really important to know about what's going on with these class actions. They were only certified a few months ago, so there's still a lot of work to be done. But basically, um, and I'm no longer, I'm not involved in these particular cases, so I can only um, report on what I have admired from afar now. Um, but they are alleging that the boards aren't actually providing full relief, meaningful relief. They're not adequately implementing the Hegel Memorandum and um, that more the, the boards need to do more. Um, so I've put on here the links to, to the websites that provide case updates. So if you are interested, you should keep tracking those um, because I'm sure there is more to come. Um, but one important lesson to take away from these is that change is possible. Um, and their going to federal court can create meaningful change within our lifetimes. Um, But and a really important point was made earlier in the program that we can't forget that the whole game of veterans' benefits isn't just on the federal level. There are some really important benefits that are provided by states. Um, and in Massachusetts, where I work, we actually have a cash assistance program for low-income veterans where they can get you know, $1,000 a month from, from, the, from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts if they don't have other income um, to help support them. And these state veterans benefits programs often have similar sort of character of discharge requirements as the federal VA, um, but they might be phrased differently. And it's really important to, to pay attention to those. What are the eligibility criteria? Are they open to veterans who have less than honorable discharges? And the way that it works in Massachusetts, um, it's phrased differently, but it's, it's very much like the VA standard where it asks, was their last discharge or release from military service not dishonorable? And there's the possibility to argue that a veteran with an other than honorable discharge is not dishonorable. Um, but what we see at the state, at the, the, the city and town level that administers this program is that veterans with other than honorable discharges are just routinely denied and said, you're not eligible, go get a discharge upgrade. Um, so we have represented a number of these veterans and gone all the way up to, we have to appeal up to our state superior court and been able to successfully get veterans recognized under state law um, and become eligible for state veterans benefits. So it's important just not to, to look, not just at the federal government as a big area of action, but also remember that the states can be an, an important battleground um, for um, advancing veterans' rights. Um, then, um, so I say that we should focus on the states and then I talk about other federal work, but um, forgive the non sequitur, but this is actually um, an ongoing project that I really want to flag for you all now because there is stuff that's about to come and we would really love people to be involved. So um, Rose taught you earlier today about all of the character discharge regulations, 3.12, um, and the statutory, the regulatory bars that exclude a lot of veterans from uh, accessing VA services. And the fact is that 85% of the veterans who are excluded based on, from VA are excluded based on regulations that VA themselves wrote. And there, there are those um, words that Rose taught you, like willful and persistent misconduct or moral turpitude. And what does that really mean, right? They're incredibly vague. There's a lot of room for different adjudicators to interpret them differently. And they're also really untethered from military law. No one would have gotten a dishonorable discharge for you know, missing formation a couple of times. Um, and yet they might be excluded from VA for missing formation a couple of times. Um, and so um, on behalf of, this was actually an initiative of Swords to Plowshares, where Rose works, um, and we came onto the team pretty early on to represent them in a petition for rulemaking to the Department of Veterans Affairs to update their rules, to change the regulations that apply to these character of discharge determinations. And back in, based on a lot of work that we did, based on the petition, the VA actually agreed that they're going to update their rules. That was in May 2016, so we're now coming up on three years, but we um, have been told that um, later this year 
VA actual, actually will be issuing a proposed rule, new regulations that govern character of discharge determinations, and they'll be opening it up for public comment. We'll have 60 days to say, we like your rules and this is why, we don't like your rules and this is how you should change them, and here are some veteran stories about how they could be affected um, by the changes that you are making. Um, and so for anyone who's interested in participating in that um, rulemaking process, I would, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to have more people involved because I think the more that we can actually hear veteran stories, hear about what it's like on the ground, um, hear about what the, what the impact of the rules would be, um, the more likely we are to get favorable rules. And given that the last time the VA looked at these rules was 50 years ago, we may be stuck with these rules for a while, so let's make sure they're as good as possible. Um, and I just do want to emphasize that this project, like all others, really came out of the, the individual advocacy that we were doing on the ground level. We were going to these COD hearings. We were going with veterans to the VA hospital and seeing them told, oh, I look at your DD-214, it says OTH, go get a discharge upgrade, come back to me. And that was really the impetus to do this sort of larger um, project. In conjunction with that, um, we, because the petition for rulemaking was kind of dense and it was argued to VA, um, we ended up um, reframing it into a white paper um, that I included the link to here. And it has a lot of great data about the veterans uh, population who have less than honorable discharges, changing rates over time, um, some of the, his the legislative history of the term other than dishonorable that was supposed to be a liberalizing rule um, put in place by the World War II era Congress as part of the GI Bill. Um, and I will say that white, writing white papers, writing reports like this um, can be a really powerful advocacy tool. I've listed a number up here um, from other organizations and they're a great jumping off point for other types of advocacy that, pe that we're, we'll talk about like working with members of Congress. They can be really great tools for putting your individual discharge upgrade case in context. Um, and they do, so they do, I think, you know, three main things. They, they create knowledge for advocates because there's a lot of information out there that you, you need to know to do this work well. Um, and they're a great, this is a great way to get that uh, knowledge. They increase public awareness, especially in media and in Congress, where people might actually be able to help pressure change. And they, then three, they actually do pressure agency change. I think um, part of the reason that VA took favorable action was because we issued a report. There were members of Congress who started asking about it at hearings. It got covered in, a, in the New York Times. That um, then made them think, you know, I need to move this up on the priority list. We need to actually make some change if so many people are bothering about us about it. Um, and I actually think it's helpful because to some government agencies because they don't have time to analyze all of the data or collect all of the stories. They don't see the on the ground, um, what it's like on the ground in the way that we all do. And so bringing this to their, to their attention and having a conversation about it is I think sometimes a real value and they, and they do care about it. Um, if you pitch it in the right way. Um, so I'll just move quickly. Um, I have engaged in some legislative advocacy. Again, it can be a real value to work with congressional offices um, and let them know about what you're seeing on the ground. Um, they can help in individual cases, but they can also, um, you know, they write bills all the time and there are lots of lobbyists who are getting paid a lot of money to tell them how laws should be written. Um, and they may not have the same interests at heart that we working with the veterans community do, and we can provide really valuable input on, this is how that would work, and maybe you should phrase it differently, or have you considered adding this as well? So knowing that there actually are people, um, and it's great that you have, um, I know the clinic, and uh, all of you in Montana have such a great representative in Senator Tester, who really cares about these issues, to, to keep in touch with um, folks there who can actually you know, create change at a level that that we can't always do individually. And lastly, I just want to pitch um, uh, this discharge upgrade manual. So um, Rob mentioned earlier that there we once had a great discharge upgrade manual that was written by Adelson and Etlinger that was published by MBLSP um, that really was a great foundation for practice. And it fell out of, it stopped being updated in 1990 and we've 
Um, it provides a lot of value now, but it's not updated for the modern era. And so there was an initiative that was started by actually Swords to Plowshares and the Connecticut Veterans Legal Center. And um, we at our clinic have come on board more recently to create a new discharge upgrade manual. Um, and I think it will be a huge value to a lot of pro bono attorneys, to practitioners of all sorts, um, because it will really talk about the practical sides of how do you take a case from beginning to end. It will talk about meaningful cases. It will give you case examples. It will compile case law for you. Um, it will help you sort of screen for procedural errors. Um, and uh, so it is not ready yet, but we're hoping in the next year or so that um, I'll be able to, it, it will be available to people. Um, and so we're hoping that this will be a foundation on which we can all start working to um, continue the advance of, of discharge upgrade practice. Nice to see everyone again, uh, shifting gears from the character of discharge information I was sharing primarily geared towards individual advocacy and representation. As Dana mentioned, you know, it really was a mess. A lot of those terms weren't very concrete. It does create some room for advocacy, but also room for the VA to issue denials without a really strong basis. So hopefully in the next coming months, you can actually forget everything I just told you and have something better to learn for stronger advocacy. So I will talk a little bit about some advocacy initiatives that Swords to Plowshares has undertaken. I uh, said a little bit about Swords to Plowshares earlier and really our bread and butter is individual representation. We provide legal services to about 700 veterans a year, so that's really our priority area. We focus on homeless veterans, um, veterans with severe mental health issues. That being said, we do engage in advocacy work, but it has to really fit in with the individual representation. So I wanted to share a few ways that we do contribute to impact work, even though we're not, a, of course, a class action firm or anything like that. And one somewhat recent example I wanted to share is an amicus brief we wrote for um, sort of a landmark case. I don't know if anybody's heard of the what's known as the Monk case. Um, until 2017, veterans were not permitted to file class actions for VA benefits in the Court of Appeals of Veterans Claims. It just was, was not allowed. It was a long process. It got appealed up to the Federal Circuit, and the Federal Circuit um, said, <clears throat> yes, of course, veterans can file class action. It was remanded, and it is still ongoing. But most recently, the Court of Appeals of Veterans Claims um, did recognize that they will entertain class actions. Um, they're going to follow Rule 23 largely. So it has really opened up a really big space. Um, so you should get creative. Think about you know problems you're seeing in the VA space with character of discharges, um, with disability benefits, now you can file class actions. So that's wide open and very exciting. So how SWORDS contribute to this, we didn't bring the class action, but we wrote an amicus brief to support the class action, and we focused the amicus brief on individual client stories. So the, the crux of the Monk class action was the allegation that VA appeals delays are unconstitutional. So when a veteran waits for a year or more for an appeals decision, that violates due process. And there was a lot of amazing briefing done, a lot of different amicus briefs um, from administrative law professors, um, class action experts all across the space. And our contribution was providing client story. So what happens to these veterans when they're waiting for an appeals decision, when they're waiting for an average of six years? What is the damage that's being done? And not only is that compelling to a judge from a human perspective, it's legally relevant. Um, the, the effect on private interests is part of the constitutional analysis. So I do think our amicus brief was a value add. It was a way of bringing the direct services work directly into the impact space without actually bringing a class action ourselves. Um, we also do advise on class action. So maybe um, an attorney in DC is you know, thinking about a class action. Maybe they've heard a few things from a few different veterans, but they want to hear a little bit more detail about what's happening more largely. So we'll, we'll talk to them. We'll talk about 
um, you know, if we're seeing that problem and if we are, if their proposed solution would actually be preferable or if there would be some untoward consequences that so we advise pretty regularly. Another thing we do is um, sometimes connect people who are doing impact work with petitioners. Um, the federal government does have a habit of mooting out petitioners. So if somebody um, is a class representative, they're alleging um, you know, they've been waiting for four years for a decision, this wait time is unconstitutional, all of a sudden the VA decides their case and the class action would go away. So we have um, a lot of connections with people doing the impact work and are regularly in contact with them to help keep the class action alive. And I really think that's part of the beauty of how tight knit the veterans community is. Even though people are doing pretty diverse types of work, um, people are really talking to each other. And I think that's really important, even you know if you're not an attorney working with homeless veterans in San Francisco, maybe you're doing something entirely different, there will probably be some way that we could help one another do our work better. Next, I wanted to travel back in time briefly. Dana mentioned that we were both in the Yale Law Veterans Clinic a few years ago. Since we're at a law school, some law students in the room wanted to talk about a policy project that I worked on at Yale. So we've talked a little bit, military sexual trauma has come up at a few points today. Um, so veterans can get disability benefits for mental health conditions that result from military sexual trauma. Um, it can be for um, PTS or other mental health issues. And the way this project started is anecdotally, there was a sense in the veterans community that veterans who filed a disability claim for post-traumatic stress based on military sexual trauma had much lower grant rates than veterans who filed a claim for post-traumatic stress based on combat. So that's something that was um, believed to be happening in the community, but there was no data behind this. And that's, I think, something I really want to highlight in terms of advocacy, that you may be seeing something happening on the ground, but you know, Dana pointed out the power of white papers to really elevate that, to be able to push for a change. It's really important to have data. So at the Yale Clinic, what we did is we filed some FOIA suits to get access to the VA data on these grant rates, uh, comparing uh, post-traumatic stress claims based on combat versus military sexual trauma to see if, in fact, there was a statistically significant difference in grant rates. It took a little while, surprise, surprise, to get the data, but once we did and crunched the numbers, we did, in fact, find there was a statistically significant difference between the grant rates um, when the origin was combat versus military sexual trauma. We looked at four years and the difference ranged between about 20% to 30% difference. So that's, a, that's a big difference. That's a lot of people who have experienced military sexual trauma who are being denied. We also looked at geographic variation. We were curious to see if different regional offices were handling military sexual trauma claims differently. And we did find some pretty striking differences. Um, we had a, a worst offenders list. Detroit was pretty bad, as I recall. Um, St. Paul was pretty bad. St. Louis were pretty bad. And that to us raised some alarm bells. So not only are the VA's rules on military sexual trauma problematic, we also Found there was arbitrariness across the country, um, which is, you know, to state the obvious, really unfair. It shouldn't make a difference if you live in California or Montana in terms of whether your military sexual trauma claim is going to be granted. So the next step for us is we wanted to envision what a better standard would look like. How can we equalize this? How can we put military sexual trauma victims on equal footing with veterans who have experienced combat, and what we proposed was applying the same evidentiary requirement um, for military sexual trauma claims as those for combat. Um, for veterans who have experienced combat to support a disability benefit claim, you need a um, PTSD diagnosis from a clinician and a statement describing what happened, but you do not need corroboration in your service records. Um, according to the rule, as long as what you say in your statement is consistent 
with the circumstances of your service, they will accept that. And it's just an understanding that things happen in combat, they may not be documented, so we will take you at your word. And we argued that should apply to military sexual trauma survivors, because they were required to provide some, they call them markers, some documentation in their service records. They don't necessarily have to have reported it. The VA has an understanding that it's underreported, but there has to be some markers in service. And to us, this was uh, on its face, the regulation looked uh, inequitable, and we found in the disparity in grant rates that it was practically inequitable too. And going back to petitions for rulemaking, the clinic filed a petition for, for rulemaking, and long story short, it was denied. The clinic now is gathering new data, new FOIA suits, and expanding what they're looking at to include TBI. And they are also very concerned about gender disparities. An additional finding was that male veterans who filed claims for military sexual trauma were um, denied at higher rates than female veterans who applied for benefits. So a lot of reasons to be alarmed, and it's still a, a fight that the clinic is waging. I also wanted to take off my lawyer hat for a second and remind everyone about a diff different advocacy tool, and that is using the media. And there are different ways to do this depending on your goals. So it could be something like writing an op-ed. Um, you might want to write it locally. You might want to take it to a national stage. Um, I've also found that journalists, especially those covering the military or veterans beat, are often looking for experts. Um, so you can be very valuable, you know, your knowledge of the law from having worked with individual clients to get them up to speed on specific issues. Um, press releases are also another way. You're not reliant on an outlet to get those out. And media advocacy can be helpful in a few different ways. It can reach members of Congress, um, to hopefully push legislation um, to start in certain directions or shift it in other directions. Um, we've talked about funding a few times today, about having uh, trying to get funding to start initiatives. And this can be a way to publicize your good work, really get that out there. And I used to work for the federal government in agency, in Congress, and I really saw the power of the media there. Um, people are really getting press clippings every day, and it's um, not an overstatement to say that a USA Today op-ed can move mountains in certain cases. So I would you know, really encourage everyone, if you see something that you know, looks bad. I often find myself telling family and friends that what veterans go through is actually worse than what you see on the news. There's a lot of bad news out there, but I think it's actually worse. So when you're feeling like that, I think it's that's a good indicator that it's something that other people need to hear about. Um, just to give a recent example, I recently wrote an op-ed about a client I worked with for a character of discharge case, and this was really a case where I had that feeling, you know, this is Horrible, people don't know how horrible this is. Um, so I wrote an op-ed about it. This was a Marine veteran um, who did three tours in Iraq, had a Purple Heart, and it took the VA almost a decade to recognize that he was a veteran. Um, to me, it seemed like it should have really been an open and shut case, but it was just a, a series of ministerial errors, the VA ignoring evidence, and I thought it was a really strong example of how problematic this system is. It really should not take a decade for the VA to recognize um, that somebody with three tours in Iraq and a Purple Heart is a veteran, but that's, that's how long it took. Um, I also wanted to note some of the complications that can come up with media. As an attorney, my impulse is always towards privacy, so it actually is a very strange feeling to talk about clients publicly, um, let alone have it in the press. So I think that can take um, sort of a, a change in perspective and mindset, and also not to underestimate the strength of clients. Um, sometimes, you know, I feel a little queasy asking them, like, are you interested in having your story out there? And I often find that that same public service motivation that brought them to the service, they'll often ask, you know, if this is gonna help other veterans, I will do it. I've very rarely had people say they don't want their story out there. So, you know, don't be afraid to ask it over your lawyerly inclination to keep everything private, of course, as long as you have permission. 
Just tell them not to leave, read the comments section. Yes, never, no, do not read the comments never section. Never read the comments on the online pages. No. Or only select ones. Um, a short postscript. So um, my Wall Street Journal editor said, let's hope this op-ed lands on the desk of somebody important at the VA. And it seems that it did not that long after, after the op-ed. Um, the secretary of the VA announced that they would be prioritizing claims for veterans with Purple Hearts. So apparently somebody did read it. The interesting twist here is the op-ed was about bad paper and character of discharges. Um, so the VA did gloss over that issue. So that problem is still there. Uh, veterans are still waiting for a decade for their veteran status to be recognized. But to me, the silver lining is that um, it is a sign that the VA is listening. They are listening to criticism. So if you see something bad, um, get loud about it. Okay, I'm ready for, Justine, we're going to load your slides. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'll just go ahead and start. Um, in addition to all of, right of the impacts advocacy that they talked about, oh, no, sorry. another idea you can think about is helping veterans with less than fully honorable discharges um, without having to rely on veteran-specific benefits, even though you might be waiting, because you might be waiting a while for um, a discharge upgrade to go through to get that veteran status that they're entitled to or for VA benefits. Uh, remember, veterans are also members of the public, so they can also be entitled to public benefits. One of the projects that I did as an Equal Justice Works fellow was um, I ran and coordinated uh, law student veterans' rights groups within New York City. So veterans' groups at Columbia, New York University and Brooklyn Law School were all trained in uh, establishing, conducting client interviews, um, cultural competency, veteran military issues, um, and then also training on fair hearings, which are administrative hearings that um, challenge the discontinuance, the denial, the reduction of uh, public benefits like Medicaid, food stamps, cash assistance, emergency assistance grants, um, depending on the specific state or locality, you might have more or less programs. Um, but a lot of these programs are federally funded, so all states have a, at least some type of welfare programs that they can help veterans with less than fully honorable um, Discharges obtained, which will help maintain contact with your veterans because that'll help them maintain stable housing um, and then also health care. So you won't have to track them down at, at the you know, hospitals every time you know, they go missing. They can have their medications and stay within the community and stay in contact within um, the community that they're in. Um, so I went through that. So during my fellowship, we got 60 law students to represent veterans in fair hearings, um, challenging you know, improper agency actions to uh, their public benefits. Now, training these students uh, took about two hours. A lot of the issues that come up with discontinuances of these benefits are um, constitutional due process rights. They, they're entitled to adequate and timely notice, which a lot of these local so, social service agencies, they're, um, they, they don't necessarily provide. So what we were able to do through those training of the common legal issues that we're seeing in the improper agency actions for the public benefits issues or um, challenge. And ultimately, we got, within those two years, $150,000 in lost benefits restored. Um, I'll let you go through the results on this slide on your own in the interest of time. But um, it's totally doable, and you can do it with uh, limited resources, because uh, all you really need to do is, is really figure out a project 
or um, a kind of advocacy, I guess, um, either impact or direct services, figure out what the need is and how you can fill that need, and then figure out ways to propose that type of project. There's through an Equal Justice Works Fellowship, through other grants or scattered fellowships. So there's ultimately, the first thing is use your creativity and then um, these types of results can happen. So um, I'm gonna take off my advocacy hat a little bit and uh, talk about our New York State Discharge Upgrade Advisory Board. Um, you know, typically in my role, I'm an advocate and I'm working with clients and uh, doing amicus briefs <clears throat> and working with students. Um, and this is a different role for me uh, with the advisory board. So uh, to give a little bit of background, in 2018, uh, <clears throat> we established this New York State Discharge Upgrade Advisory Board. It's the first in the nation of its kind, but uh, back in the 80s after Vietnam, uh, the Department of Labor uh, saw that veterans were coming home with a lower than honorable discharge and were having a, you know, a tough time getting uh, jobs in the market because uh, of their discharge. And so Department of Labor had this type of discharge upgrade advisory board where they would help veterans uh, by writing advisory opinions for them uh, to the uh, various discharge upgrade boards. You probably have talked about them uh, many times, the discharge review boards and the Board of Corrections for Military Records. You know, over the years that stopped happening, probably because of funding, uh, because maybe Department of Labor thought that was not a need any longer. Uh, you know, Vietnam was, was long gone and uh, they thought they fixed the problem. And unfortunately they did not. Um, as you know, uh, many veterans uh, have lower than honorable discharges that need uh, to get employment, need to get VA benefits, need to get health care. And um, so New York State uh, was able to stand up an advisory board. And it was actually Ben Pomerantz from the state who pushed this through um, to get the state to back us and to uh, bring practitioners to the board and look at applications from New York State uh, veterans who are applying to the boards to give, give it a once over and write an opinion um, advising the boards what they should do. And so if you, uh, anyone in Montana or anyone around the country that's thinking maybe this might be something for your state, uh, Ben definitely said to give him a, a, a call, give him an email, and he'd be happy to talk about it because he really is the brainchild behind this. Um, I'm a board member and uh, you know I, I, we discussed these, uh, these applications, but I'm not uh, the one who came up with the idea. So the board consists of attorneys, advocates uh, mostly, uh, but there are some former JAG attorneys, uh, prosecutors who are on the board, uh, former district attorneys, legal aid attorneys, um, and a judge who was at the, uh, was a veterans treatment court judge, uh, all sitting around the table. And uh, we all look at these applications to you know, discuss whether this uh, deserves um, or is, 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 a, is a good application to the boards for a discharge upgrade. And these discussions can be really tough because what deserves a supporting letter or uh, argument is, is tough for, for anybody to make. Um, and so we are um, in the early stages of um, reviewing applications uh, when a, uh, right now we're mostly getting applications from veteran service organizations so mostly non-attorneys non who don't know this area well enough. And so they're giving us you know, the, uh, the application for the discharge upgrade um, and hopefully having um, all of the pieces to it. So we look at whether the, this would be a meritorious uh, type of application. And, you know, we, we'll look for uh, procedural errors like you would do as an advocate. I, we'd look for um, any, uh, any injustice um, issues. And if we don't see any, you know, we'll go back to the, to the veteran and, the, and their advocate and say, you know, we don't see it, unfortunately we can't write one. But if we do see something that seems meritorious or on that cusp of maybe they just need one more piece of supporting evidence to you know, bolster their arguments uh, because they don't have an attorney working for them, you know, we can write that in support as kind of an, an unbiased uh, a board. 
Um, it's always tough for me to be on the board because I want to be an advocate and tell them what they should be arguing when maybe they didn't actually argue. Um, the one qualification is they have to be a New York State resident, uh, but we'll look at any discharge upgrade issues that come up. And this is what we expect the uh, veteran or their advocate to submit. Um, pretty baseline stuff, the DD-214, uh, separation packet, uh, service treatment records if they're relevant, uh, the OMPF, uh, the actual application that's going to go to the DRB or the BCMR. So we know what the, they are going to be looking at when, um, when it gets to the official board. We want a personal statement to get an idea from the, the veteran what they think. And then if it has to do with a TBI or PTSD, um, you know, we want to see a little bit more um, so that we can look at Hegel and look at uh, uh, look at uh, CURTA to see if that um, if we can help support it based on those uh, legal arguments. So if there's a nexus opinion or opinion from a doctor that always that always helps. Um, obviously, medical opinions that they have the diagnosis would help as well. And then this is the way you submit it. Um, I will be honest. Most of our cases right now come from veteran service organizations, specifically the state reps, because they know it, know that we exist. Uh, we haven't done a great job getting the word out that we exist. And so, um, you know, as I, I think as we figure out exactly what we're doing and how we're going to be writing these opinions to uh, the boards, I think we'll push it out more and more um, to get, you know, more applications from all of the work, uh, veteran service organizations and even attorneys um, who may have a difficult case and just need one more piece that might, you know, push that over the edge so that they can um, help their, their clients out. That's that's what I got. It's a lot. Thank you. It's it's great. I mean, in the best way. Thank you, Elena. So uh, I'm going to ask maybe uh, we're going to wrap this up uh, fairly soon. But I'm going to ask a question or two. Then we're going to open it up to the uh, to the audience for questions. Um, one thing that uh, Rose and Dana touched upon was, you know, my question is, what are the benefits of combining? direct representation, you know, individual applications, and other forms of advocacy? How do they complement each other? And conversely, do they ever contradict each other? So I know that Rose and, and Dan, you've already said that, you know, great large-scale policy efforts have been inspired by what you're seeing at the street level, which is true. Um, but can you also, I mean, let's, in a broader sense, can the panel talk about um, what it means to start expanding your uh, your toolkit, like for example, Rose, like that's very high level press strategies that you're enacting there. That's great. I mean, and I, I, I imagine that makes expand your mind on things other than the the things that you're working on. So can we talk about a little bit about the benefits of um, broadening your sort of your, your scope of advocacy, and then uh, any contradictions that this might also create? I can say something about contradictions. I often find. Um, at sorts of plowshares, it's a very uncomfortable calculus because, like I said, we're a direct services shop. So if you're thinking about undertaking a large advocacy effort, unless you have an additional pot of money coming in, you're thinking this amicus brief, you know, maybe this will take the number of hours it would take to help, I don't know, making this up, uh, you know, 30 homeless veterans in San Francisco get their benefits, and that's, you know, a difficult thing to think about. So that to me can be a form of contradiction. You know, it's a trade-off. Uh, everyone's time is really limited. This is a very resource strapped area of law that needs more investment. So it really can feel like a, a, a trade-off. Um, I think some ways to work around that and that source of plowshares has done is we will often work with firms to do some of these efforts. So for example, for the um, what I mentioned, the Monk class action amicus brief, we worked with um, a large firm on that brief and that you know helped us. It took a little bit less time. Another helpful way is fellows, getting fellows in. Um, funders are really excited about funding you know, innovative new projects. You know, they usually want a direct services component, but that's a way to bring somebody in uh, to have that space to take on new efforts, but overall, because the veteran population is so far underserved, I still think that that tension is going to be there. I mean, Rose is absolutely right. It, it can feel really difficult to say, you know, I'm going to step away and not take one more individual veteran's case so that I can do this 
big project where I can't, won't necessarily see the impact um, that it will have on the ground for individual veterans. But, um, you know, I live with the reality that, you know, I know it's a problem that a lot of veterans try with less than honorable discharges will go up and try to get access to VA medical care and be told, just just go away. You, you have to get a discharge upgrade in order to get any services. I know that's a problem. And I also know that I will, if I meet that person, I can fix that. That's a relatively easy problem to go with them to the VA to make sure that they actually take the application to follow it along. It's a fixable problem, but that I won't ever meet every single veteran um, who has that problem. So the only way to really stop it from happening is to work on a more systemic level. Um, and we, as lawyers, I mean, we have duties to the clients who we actually have, but sometimes I think we need to think more, you know, what are our duties to the future clients that we could have? What can we do to make the world better so that we stop seeing this problem? Um, so, I mean, there are on the, it's also, I think, a, one of the conflicts can be, you know, you're often asking a particular veteran to, to put themselves out, um, to make their, their um, the difficulties in their lives public, um, something that they may have never shared with, a fa with their family members, um, they're now sharing with the world. Um, and they're the ones who have to be the face of this. And I am just constantly in awe of the bravery that the veterans who I work with show in standing up for other veterans and saying, I don't care what, what I suffer um, at, in order to, um, by putting my story out there, if I can help other veterans, it is worth it for me. We're, you know, we were brothers in arms then, we're brothers in arms now. Um, and so I've always found our clients to be so willing to be part of these more systemic initiatives because they still want to be of service um, to, to their fellow veterans. Um, and there really are a lot of, of benefits, um, not to just talk about the contradictions, but to talk about the benefits of it, um, that when you're doing the individual cases, um, you know, you see the patterns, you know what the fixes need to be in a way that someone who is only working at the higher level doesn't understand the systems. Um, and so it's a really great way, if you can marry individual advocacy with larger projects, um, to, to do a lot of work and make a lot of change. One of our goals about this panel was to inspire inspire others, particularly starting with the people people in this room. So, if you have questions about some of these initiatives or, or the the, mechan the, uh, mecha uh, the mechanics behind them, et cetera, and the you know, Montana, the, the thing is, we well, got no money, and if you could figure out a way for the government to pay for something that we can't, and it sounds like what you're doing is you're using the state board to try and encourage the DRBs and the, and the BCMRs to get approved. And I, so I wonder how new the program is and actually working? Because if it's working, I mean, that might be something that we could sell here in Montana. So the program is brand new. Uh, 2018 is when we stood up and we met for the first time. Uh, we have these monthly meetings to go over applications. Uh, everybody on the board, is volunteering their time. So it costs nothing for us to do it. Uh, the state is supporting us, but not actually funding us. Um, so kind of out of the goodness of the heart of our hearts, are we doing it? Um, but because we know that it will help veterans in the future um, to have a state board support them. Um, so at this point, it actually doesn't cost them anything. Um, and we don't know the successes though. So we're still kind of waiting to see you know, we've sent in, I think, two letters of support so far, so not very many, uh, but you've submitted those two, and, you know, we'll see what comes out. Again, we don't actually know if that will have a different impact depending on, you know, the data that we get back. Uh, for, the, okay. for the Discharge Advisory Board, does it matter if the uh, claimant is represented or do they only do it for pro se? We would take applications from uh, pro se applicants, VSO uh, represented and attorney represented. I don't think we have any bias towards the, either one. Um, it would be, you know, it's nice if we had a VSO because they can get access to those records fairly quickly. So if we're missing, let's say the DD-214 or personnel records, um, you know, they may be able to get those a little bit quicker than the veteran themselves. Thank you. And then just for the board, everyone, um, as far as client control goes, because I, from experience, sometimes clients will want to shotgun things. And so they'll come to you and they'll file an inspector general and then they'll file a congressional 
do you, they have to agree to to kind of coordinate through you or the representative so that they're not firing these things off? And do you require all those other uh, administrative actions to be closed before you will take a client, say the IGs and the congressionals and so forth? As, it, as On the advisory board, not in my Syracuse capacity. As far as the legal assistance goes, will you wait for different avenues to be closed before you will accept a client? Uh, speaking for sorts of plowshares, we do not wait for other avenues to be closed. And in our legal retainers, we do have a clause saying that everything has to go through us so they can't have this. Um, we could do a shotgun approach together. We can sure. do all this stuff together. But, you know, as the attorney, I have to know everything that's going on. So that's a very basic part of our legal retainer. Yeah. I mean, I'll say, like, um, Bruce, we don't require that, you know, the case be any particular stage. Um, certainly, if they have an open discharge upgrade case that they filed on their own, we probably wouldn't take them on unless there's a really good reason to. We'd wait for them to get a decision um, and then consider repealing if it's denied. Um, but, you know, if I have found that a lot of veterans do want to take some control over their case. And so it's often just um, a conversation about what, what are the things where it would be really helpful and you can work on this and you can do that. And then we'll, t we'll talk about what to do with the information you gather um, um, and knowing, being able to sort of assess and develop that trust of, and um, understand who are the clients you have who will, who are more likely to do that and how to, how to direct that energy in a way that puts the case po in a positive direction rather than sort of makes a messier landscape. Yeah, I think I piggybacking off of what they said, just keep um, everybody, you and the client, informed with all the different types of approaches that's going on. Um, I, I don't tend to wait for other things to close um, in order to accept a case. Most a lot of times, uh, uh, you can help your veteran client make contact with the congressional office, um, follow up with them, you know, have them sign releases. So if they're unavailable to to fax the documents that they want their congressperson to know, you can do it for them, and it can be a really productive col collaborative team approach to getting the resources that your client needs to get. Um, are there any more questions from the audience here in the back row? Okay, then uh, we'll bring it up front. And I think it'll be... Uh, I really have to commend you for the class actions, the FOIA lawsuits, the request to update the federal regulations, and the press. I mean, that that's... I mean, it's important to do all that other work, but this is the best way to use attorney talent the most effectively, I think. Thank you. Around uh, the MST sexual abuse, uh, uh, that's been slow in coming. And I think it's uh, in, almost institutional. Uh, it's kind of a power and control thing. But I'm glad uh, 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 that it's, we're making progress. And, and do you guys think we're actually making progress? Or uh, any one of you uh, want to say anything about that? I, I, I think we're making progress. I do think we are. I mean, I've heard exactly what Rose had said about changing the standard for um, for proving mental health claims related to MST. I mean, it's it's going to be actively considered. I think we. I have seen veterans individually who didn't report years ago who are willing to come forward now because they think that there might be a more welcoming environment. And there's still a, a lot of work to be done. But I think we're in a better place now than we were 10 years ago, no question about it. And it's an interesting thing about, about all four of you is that you're fairly early on in your career. I mean, all, you, all of you are experienced, but you're for, in terms of if we're thinking about whatever, 50-year career, 60-year career, you're at the early stages of it. You've all fought battles. You've had some temporary setbacks, as somebody might say. You've also had some victories. You've, you've, in, you've all taken on positions of increasing responsibility in this community, right? So... You know, here at sort of the end of the day, we've talked about hope, we've talked about some despair, we've talked about 
prom the promises in this field. All of you are very committed to veterans law, which is which is an incredible thing. So how do personally, right, if we're talking in terms of the language of vocation or at the end of the day when we're thinking about how we're spending our time on planet Earth or even in a larger sense, we don't have to get into a conversation about trauma stewardship, but but enduring enduring this, this the challenges that come with this type of advocacy i mean where are you all like individually i mean where, i mean in terms of in terms of uh, i mean obviously you've doubled down on your commitment not only to veterans but to these these greater issues and struggles and building competency so i guess it's a it's a somewhat personal question but you're incredible representatives to ask it and i think there's so i feel like there's a sense in the audience about um, about like where do we go next, and you know, and and what do and some of it feels so large, and how can I you know change X, Y, and Z? So I, I thought it would be just helpful to hear from you. I know, big question. That's big, Rob. Yeah, I know, yeah. but I, I felt like it was in the air, and I, I thought it was worth asking. I mean, Yelena, you're moving back, you're going back to the the John Marshall Clinic where it all began for you, right? I got lucky, you know, in law school that I was a part of a clinic, and many of you in Montana, through the students in the room. Had that have that opportunity now, um, you know, figure out what you like. You know, if this is something you find passion in, the clients, the the law, um, you know, changing someone's life. This is, you know, I was lucky to find something in law school, um, similar to the panel, the other panelists here. Uh, find something that you love and um, kind of good at. Uh, so that that helped. Uh, the setbacks, you know, suck. Uh, you, but you get mad, right? You get mad at the military, you get mad at the VA, and you kind of ch channel that in the, in the work you do. And I think that that pushes me along is getting mad, but also seeing students uh, get excited about the work they get to do. I mean, uh, I mean, Justine, you're back in a, in a serious, in, a seri you're trying to build a docket out in, in, in Virginia, and you've spent enough, in vet, you spent so much time in vet centers and building up the outreach you did in New York, and now you're in a separate state, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're and you're faced with continually some of in a class of vets who need profound uh, service and representation. You are among the most vulnerable of those vets on a regular basis, and you've been doing this for several years, several several years now. So, what, what's what's your view of the landscape? My view of the landscape. Um, it changes by the moment, by the day. Uh, sometimes I really hate the world. <laughs> but as Galena said, um, anger can be a strong motivating factor to keep going. Uh, and, and honestly, every veteran client that I meet, that I work with, it's just one more reason. So I, I guess I, I, by now I have hundreds of reasons why I continue to do what I do. Um, and I just, I love the work. I love the people that, that I serve. And that's reason enough for me to, to keep going. So and I guess to Rose and Dana, just to wrap this, wrap this up, is that so we're all three of us spent time with similar, with, with a group of mentors or probably lineage of, of people who have done, had spent time and been trained in the veterans legal services at Yale. And not everybody has gone, um, I think everybody, people have different levels of involvement with veterans law after graduation. But, but both of you are, are, are two alums of that clinic who are deeply involved and you've cho chosen vocationally. So what's it, uh, you know, I guess there was a point when you went into the clinic, I'm not sure, you know, we've never, I guess, really talked about our origin story, so to speak. But, I mean, but now you're getting your level of involvement and the things that, you're, that your vision and the way you speak to a crowd about what's, what's in the realm of the possible is so expansive. So, like, so what do you, you know, when you look back at, at the last, say, five or six years, I mean, what do you, what do you see personally, and how do you see the landscape moving forward? I mean, some of this has already been answered a little bit by Dana, but. I, don't know, I feel like um, sort of a motto I've come to develop. I think there um, the lows are very, very low, and the highs are very, very high. But I think what I've developed out of that is just a feeling of not letting them control the narrative, and that goes for looking at COD regulations or any kind of case. Um, there are a number of cases I've taken on. There are veterans who turned away from other attorneys. You know, oh, you had more than 10 NJPs, no merit, you know, go away. Or this doesn't cleanly fit under this regulation. I think what's exciting about this area of law is that um, it's relatively new in terms of an influx of attorneys. So I think there are a lot of, um, a lot of room for creativity, for um, sort of unusual advocacy. And I found you know, take take that hard case, and 
if you think what happened is unjust and um, better in getting the benefits is righteous, just tell that story, find a way for it to fit within the current regulations. And I've been um, very happy to see that a lot of those cases actually get through. It just takes that kind of work and not looking at the system as it currently is and saying, you have these horrible regulations, like this just doesn't look like a case that you know somebody in the military would think would warrant justice. If it just seems wrong to you, just tell, tell the story the way that you're seeing it. All right. I'll wrap this up. But yeah. Rob, you asked for my origin story. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was at my admitted students weekend, and I met Mike Wishney, and he said he was starting this new clinic, and there's just a ton of work to be done. We There are all these veterans. There's a huge justice gap. There are lots of people who need assistance, and there's these really old laws, and people have been fighting them for a long time. And I said, great, sign me up. Um, and I have never found that there's not still work to be done, and so I am still doing it. Um, and I just, there's, there's room for all of us, and there's incredible opportunities for advocacy, and all of you in this room are totally capable of doing that advocacy. And it may not look like issuing a white paper because that may not be your thing, um, and, but it may be just counseling a veteran that, you know, if you got turned away from a VA healthcare facility, you should go back, apply again, and make sure that you just, even just counseling them, you may be eligible, could change their lives, you don't know, and it may not be that you actually represent them in that, but that you just give them the advice that someone else should have given them a, lot, a long time ago. Um, so to say there's, there's room for all of us, and I'm just constantly, um, as I said before, in awe of the veterans who I have the privilege of working with and all of these other wonderful people in the veterans legal community are incredibly generous with their time um, and incredibly collaborative. And it's just a wonderful space to be able to work in. So that's why I'm still here. So wrapping this up, I hope specifically Professor Wandler, but also all of you are telling people out there that there is a need and there's old laws, and there's people and there's veterans who need our help. And I hope people are responding to you with sign me up. And uh, I, hope, I hope you get that response a lot. Um, I want to thank our panel also, though, uh, uh, before we acknowledge them, um, uh, our gratitude for, for their presence. I also, Aaron Carruthers in the back, thank you so much. <laughs> and Kit Eddington, thank you so much. Appreciate it. I mean, that was, that was incredible. And, it's, uh, and thank you for supporting us uh, so well today and, uh, and yesterday as well. So, and I'm turning over, turning over to uh, Hillary. Um, and thank you to Rob, who was on his feet practically all the day and for facilitating all of the panels today and also organizing, as I said, that the day was um, his baby. Uh, this was maybe a sprint for me, a marathon for you. You stayed with us, and thank you for doing that. I think this final panel was worth staying for, so I really appreciate seeing as many faces as I do right now. If you are a TVSO or a TVR and you applied for a travel grant, will you please come and see me up here to receive that? Um, and then please check the event site for updates. We're going to be probably posting additional materials, but also when the video is cut and ready, we are gonna alert all of you so that you have access to that and can also distribute it to a broader audience, which was the whole intent and idea behind having a post-event video um, to reach more communities with all of this good teaching as well. So we'll let you know when that is ready. And please stay in touch with the law school and also with the Veterans Advocacy Clinic. I've had several of you come and ask if you can refer people here. And uh, the answer is yes. I'm looking at my students, right? Yes? OK. <laughs> the answer is yes. We want to help you. We consult with attorneys as well. Um, it's not a week goes by that we aren't talking with an attorney about a case they are handling for a veteran. So that's another option for those of you in the audience who are attorneys. So thank you again. And um, we'll talk soon. <laughs>